Ah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's Wednesday. That means Energy Day. Okay, this is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Mitch? Aloha, y'all. <laughs> That's I'm Mitch Ewan. From Texas. We do these things yeah. in various formats. Right. Okay. And today, Shannon Tengan Tenganan, um, and she's here from Hawaiian Electric, and we love when she comes down, and she tells us what's going on. She informs us. Welcome to the show, uh, Shannon. Nice to have Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jay. So um, t tell us what uh, the message is this time. Well, today we want to highlight our newest project. Um, just yesterday, in fact, we went into service. It's the Westlock Solar. Um, I'm sorry, Westlock Solar Project out on Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Westlock Annex. So wow. we have, I know. What's say the acronym that, for that? Say <laughs> that 12 times. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> So it's a big project, you know, it's our first uh, project, our first grid scale solar project. So uh -huh. we're really excited about it, 20 megawatts out in Eva Beach, on the Eva Plains. Uh -huh. so. This is Navy land. It is. This is it's yeah. been Navy land forever, actually, yeah. in Kalailoa, yes. or, I mean, uh, Eva Beach. <clears throat> and so, uh, how many panels you got in the, in the solar array? Nearly 81,000. But who's counting? I went out there myself. <laughs> so what is this? Is a significant project. Tell us why it's significant. It's significant because it's a partnership, you know, with the Navy. And then we also, you know, it's our first grid-scale solar project. So for the, for the company, it, it's a big deal. You know, we're very proud of the, the accomplishment of getting this online already. Um, and it just adds to our RPS, you know. We're... Trying to get to 100% by 2045. So this just is one more way to get us to that point. 20 megabytes is a substantial, substantial piece. And, and uh, did I say megabytes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was just going to let that go. I mean, I think tech, tech is our middle name. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is on Navy land, and therefore the Navy is a user. It's definitely a consumer of what you're doing, but... It's not limited to the Navy, right? No, it, it will produce energy for the entire island of Oahu. All Oahu consumers will benefit from this. And it's the lowest cost renewable energy to date. Oh, yeah, let's talk yes. about that. Lowest cost to date. Are you listening? Are you making notes? Lowest cost to date. What is the lowest cost to date? 7.5 cents. Wow. When yeah. you think Kilowatt back hour. only a few years, it yeah. was like three times that. Yeah. Neighbor islands, much more. Yeah. Uh, so, so this 7. is very 5. significant, and we're very proud of that. So what does this tell us about the future? Where, where, is, where is this point going forward? Well, all we can do is add more and more renewables. It's not always going to be Hawaiian electric projects, but it's going to be you know, independent power producers. We have you know, several projects um, already approved and ready to go that we had in our first RFP. And our second RFP, we just um, closed on applications, so we're going through those now. I think we had over 75 applications come in. That is a statement because that yeah. means a lot of people are interested in doing solar or renewable projects in the state of Hawaii. Definitely. I mean, you know, we have to reach our goal of 100% by 2045. So this is just one, one project, but, you know, it does, it's one of many coming online mm -hmm. soon. I think the uh, important point there is that uh, if you want to build a lot of renewables, you have to have a lot of projects. And to have a lot of projects, you have to have a lot of RFPs. And mm -hmm. to have a lot of RFPs, you have to have a lot of people responding. In this Definitely. case, it's Rex Solar. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you had to make a deal. You had to make deals all over the place. It's always that way. Isn't it? You have to make a deal with, in this case, the landowner, the yes. Navy. You had to make a deal with Rex Solar. Uh -huh. uh, you had to make a deal with um, the PUC. Um, Got to get through the gauntlet on this, and yeah. now you just as of what yesterday, you're actually operating, yes. and you're going to have the ceremony on Monday. Talk about the ceremony. Well, we're just going to have a Hawaiian blessing, a traditional Hawaiian blessing. We're just going to dedicate the project, you know, and just celebrate the fact that it's online now. Yeah, important. You got to important. commemorate, and in commemorating, you're also saying that there'll be more, and Definitely. you're working on others in the pipeline. Yes. Before you know it, there'll be another ceremony. Okay, Mitch, your turn. Well, I understand this project doesn't have battery storage 
a lot of the uh, wow. PV projects have storage plus batteries. Mm -hmm. So is there any particular reason why that's the case? I mean, you don't need it. Or... Oh, we applied. Yeah. And it was denied. Do they give a reason why they denied it? Uh, I don't have that. Okay. Right now, I, don't have to turn this file. Well, yeah. I, can, I can surmise this that you know if you're going, you're sending it straight into the grid. The grid has other storage um, yeah. elements in the yeah. grid, and then so a it's lot not of standing our, by yeah. itself. A lot yeah. of the projects, in fact, all of the projects that we have in our first RFP is solar plus storage. Okay. So, and then moving forward, you know, that's the way to go. Yeah. And there is a, um, is, is a connection, a reminiscence of the, the one at Schofield, which we looked at a few weeks ago, um, which is also on uh, mm -hmm. military land. Yeah. Also a, kind of a partnership with the military and a, uh, a, a developer, and yeah. uh, which serves the military but also serves the community. It's, a, it's, a, it's the same kind of pattern. When I get out of this, is this pattern is, at least as far as we can see right now, it's successful. Therefore... It should be something we'll do again and again. We hope so. I mean, this is, again, a great partnership. You know, we don't have to purchase the land, which is really, that's, you know, how right. we get the cost savings. Permitting is easier, too. Exactly. Federal government is different than the yeah. state, city, mm -hmm. what have you. So we've been very fortunate to work with the military on these projects. So are you thinking about going into the service? Yeah. <sighs> Mitch and I were both yeah, in the service, yeah, so we can relate to that. All right. <clears throat> what more you got? Oh, that's pretty well. It, I think yeah. it sounds like a pretty good project. So, yeah, congratulations on excited. getting this in place. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yes, I do have one. So, how much does it contribute? Like, we all talk about percentages, which is really tough because, like, you know, so how much does 80 megawatts represent? Probably not a huge percentage because um, we use so much electricity here. On the big island, it would be a lot. <clears throat> yeah. You know what? I'll have to get back to you on that. Well, statewide, it's, yeah. it's, in my recollection, it's about 1,800 megawatts. Um, not, not megabits or megahertz, yeah, but megawatts. Not megabytes. <clears throat> so, you, you know, 80 is, uh, you know, a fair percentage of that. Like the Big Island grid is like only 180 or 200 megawatts. So right. that would be like 10% of the Big Island grid, just to kind of yeah. give it some scale. So. But you know, the thing is, you can't take half an island dedicated to one big project. No, you <laughs> have to have not, many projects yeah. contributing. They got to yes. be around every corner. Exactly. Right? And so you add 80 here or whatever it is yes. and then again and again and again and after a while you're feeding the whole system. I guess the you know the issue is the grid and uh, actually uh, right after this break we're going to take Mitch is going to talk about the grid with some okay. entrepreneurs who are doing technology on the grid. Maybe you should meet them. <laughs> no, one other quick um, item or factoid. Uh, by 2022, we'll have about 4.4 million solar panels across wow. our service territory. So, you know, this is an exciting time, you know, for renewable energy, our core into renewable energy. So I think this is a significant project. And, you know, moving forward, we just want more and more of these. Yeah, things are happening. Uh, you know, the project in Schofield, this project, yes. uh, with, with all of the, you know, accomplishments, the achievements built into this project, uh, the, the notable best practices that are in this project. Uh, and then, of course, you have these RFPs out there where you're going to get, you know, hundreds of, of um, uh, megawatts yes. from all directions. And that's going to change the landscape, isn't it? You're in the middle of a landscape change and you've already gone really a certain will. distance. Yeah, it's going to be significant changes ahead, you know. Um, we're just excited to see what's, what's in our future. Okay, well, that means you're going to come back and talk to us some definitely, more? Okay. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Shannon Tagadon, Ryan Electric, Mitch Ewan, Jay Fidel. Break, watch this. Aloha, my name is Victoria, and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners. Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Uh, see you soon. Mahalo. Thanks to our Think Tech underwriters and grantors. The Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Munley and the Friends of ThinkTech, 
the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. I'm Richard Emery, one of the co-hosts with Condo Insider. Sitting next to my other co-host, Jane Sugimura, we're very pleased to be on Think Tech Hawaii and provide this show of education, news, and topics affecting living in an association. About 38% of our population lives in an association, and you have very specific needs and rules to make an effective pairing of your home. So we're glad to be a part of this show, and what do you think, Jane? Uh, and uh, yes, we're very uh, pr proud to be part of this uh, program. And what we want to do is to bring to all of the people who are involved with condos, especially people who sit on the boards and the owners, topics uh, that you know, will assist them in governing uh, their projects and uh, you know, dealing with issues that, you know, uh, that boards and owners have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And our show is every Thursday at 3 o'clock. We hope you watch it. And always feel free to send in topics for discussion. Aloha. Aloha. Hey, well, welcome back to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We just did a, a quick line change like we did when I used to play hockey up in Canada. And it went amazingly well and smoothly. So here we are. I'm joined uh, by uh, Derek uh, Stenslick uh, and uh, Matthew Richwine from Telos Energy a new company, new co-startup. And first of all, I want to ask uh, my guests about their individual background. So I'll start off with you, Derek. So Great, hey, yeah. So tell us about yourself. Derek Stenslick, I've been in the energy industry for about 10 years now. Uh, right. Focus that entire time on renewable integration and how we bring on more wind and solar into the grid. Uh, my background is in economics, so I've had to learn some of the engineering behind it. But fortunately, I have my, my partner here to help me out on that front. But uh, look at how how to bring on new resources cost effectively and the grid. Hey, and that. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, so my background is on the engineering side, electrical engineering for uh, so power systems. So electrical engineering applied to the grid. And uh, yeah, I've been focused on what are the technical challenges of including all of this wind and solar and renewable generation uh, onto grids like Hawaii. So I guess between the two of you, you, you one one with a background in economics, so you can tell us how much it costs. And then you can uh, surprise us how much stuff we need exactly. and uh, work out the economics. And can we afford this, correct? You got to have both. You got to have both. So I, uh, I view you as two brave guys who stepped away from a much larger company to form your own company. Very entrepreneurial of you to do that. That's, uh, that's a big step and a big deal. So tell us about your new company, Telos. Yeah, so Telos Energy, as you said, it's a clean energy startup. It's something we're really excited about, and it's our first year, just finishing up our first year in business and right. off to a great start. Uh, we specialize in analytics and technology for renewable integration, so all the other grid planning and the, the modeling, the simulation that you have to do to make sure that these grids are going to operate, like you said, reliably and uh, cost-effectively into the future as we start to bring on more and more technology. So tell me about your client list. I mean, did you already have some clients waiting in the wings or did you have to start with a clean sheet of paper and build it up? Yeah, I mean, well, we've been in the industry for a little while and, and, and have known some people, which is, of course, a helpful yeah. starting point. But, you know, we really wanted to, um, to, to focus our efforts in Hawaii because we see that, you know, a lot of the action here in the grid is, uh, in terms of across the industry, is happening right here in Hawaii in a really applied way. Where, as Shannon was just talking about, they're really putting in, you know, 81,000 more panels and, and getting to these really big numbers. Uh, it's really leading the industry, and we want it to be at the forefront of that. 
Well, you can almost look at Hawaii then as like a laboratory and uh, leading the way, as you said, uh, some leadership here. Yeah, you know, they were actually, Hawaii was actually the first state in the country to implement a 100% RPS target. And uh, since then, you've seen a host of other states follow suit from California, New York, uh, and others. So but they're really a long way behind us. And they, I guess they haven't even started to experience some of the issues we have as you add more and more, uh, particularly intermittent renewables on the grid. It's a big problem to manage that grid. I mean, like, I don't know, what's California up to? Are they, what, do you have any feel for that? Yeah, so in California, similar situation, a lot of solar growth going on, a lot of it being distributed on rooftops. Uh, in Hawaii here, it's one-third of single-family homes have right. rooftop solar, which is huge. The thing that makes Hawaii really unique is that as an island grid, there's a lot of additional challenges that California doesn't have to face. So California, it's spread out over a, a large land area, mm -hmm. so the solar doesn't all drop off at the same time. They're interconnected with neighboring systems. Correct. And so they can rely on these, these neighbors to help balance out the, as you said, the variable wind and solar generation. So here in Hawaii, it's all got to be balanced locally. HECO is ultimately the one that keeps the lights on for everybody. And, and there's challenges that go along with that. So I think you guys brought some slides along. So um, not death by PowerPoint, I might add. <laughs> so why don't we uh, pull up that first slide and you can talk a little bit about the slide, how we're doing. How are we doing? Yes, this slide just measures out kind of the RPS by each island. So you can see uh, the so progression. Just tell people what RPS means, because yeah, we've you. used that a couple of times yeah. uh, when Shannon was here. And so RPS, it's a renewable portfolio standard. Okay. So it's the percentage of the load that's being served by renewable energy. Right. Um, and so this is a combination of wind, solar, uh, solar both rooftop and utility scale, as well as some hydro and on the, the big island uh, geothermal. Yeah, and you know, as you can see these numbers, you know, where we are today um, and, and the trend and how much it's grown over a relatively brief period of time, um, but it still shows, you know, we're a long ways out still from 2045 where we've got to get all these lines to 100%. And, um, you know, we're really seeing, we're starting to see the challenges now. And as we look ahead, we are anticipating a lot more challenges and that's part of our role here right. and with Telos Energy is to help the companies and the stakeholders solve these challenges so that we can really hit these goals. So how are you doing that? How are you helping us solve our problems? Do we have a contract with you from HNEI? Do we some modeling? Is that, how does that help us uh, address these challenges? Yeah, that's right. So one of the big things we do is, you know, in the, in the power system, in the industry where, you know, we all count on electric power to be there all the time. And it's really, it's kind of, it's painful when we learn the lessons in the field. So one of the ways that we really try to mitigate and get in front of and understand okay. what the challenges are going to be is to model the system. And so Derek and I have, you know, with HNEI have very detailed models, um, economic models and engineering models of how the system works so that we can, in a modeling environment, introduce these new technologies, these higher levels of wind and solar uh, and battery resources and understand how it's going to behave and how we want it to behave um, before it gets in the field. And kind of going back to the HNEI, so we are out here with the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, uh, part of University of Hawaii, and kind of in that role that University of Hawaii and HNEI has is, is to really be a third party independent uh, kind of group for analysis and uh, policy recommendations and really to just be there to provide technical analysis in a really third-party, independent way that can be used for the Hawaii State Legislature, for the Public Utilities Commission, and for HECO. So really just trying to bring in a, a different, independent set of analysis on all these grid simulation and modeling efforts. So we're like a referee. We don't have any ax to grind here, so we can give them a, an informed, independent uh, assessment. And uh, you obviously, I guess not obviously, but you can tell me, it's do, uh, do scenario analysis, correct? Like you say, okay, well, this is the, how the grid is now. We've modeled this. I'm yeah. assuming that you validated how, you know, how closely your models replicate the grid. And then you say, well, what if we add this, this, and this here, here, and here? Is that kind of how it works? I, absolutely. I think the scenario analysis is a, is a real key piece of this. Mm -hmm. Because what's not always obvious to everyone is all of the, the huge range of conditions that happen throughout time that the grid has to survive. And 
many of the many of the times because the electricity the electric grid is so reliable it's easy to take for granted all of the considerations that go behind making it that reliable in terms of your severe weather events or unplanned loss of equipment like power lines or generating plants these are really significant disturbances to the grid and you have to make sure that when these emergency events happen the rest of the grid is able to act quickly and keep the lights on through these things so yeah it's um the scenario analysis is is a big piece of that just bringing up uh with the scenario analysis you know what brought us out here this week is actually uh to support and help facilitate HECO's integrated grid planning effort. So we're helping out the technical advisory plan, uh, panel for that. And the HECO IGP, as they call it, it's really looking at that roadmap out to 2045 and what does the utility have to do and what scenarios make sense for uh, new investments or bringing on new IPPs. So really working through that long-term roadmap of all the different scenarios that are possible out there. And, and what HECO as a utility needs to do to make sure all those pieces fit together in a cost-effective and, and reliable manner. So you hear a lot of people say, well, so far we've uh, picked the low-hanging fruit, and now it's going to get harder. What does your modeling say? Is it going to get harder, or is there still some low-hanging fruit out there that we can be picking, or is there some obvious kind of uh, effective solution that we, we should really get out there and export? I'll start off with the economic yeah. side. <laughs> sure. So certainly the low-hanging fruit uh, has, has largely been fixed. So uh, here on Oahu, there's already 500 megawatts of distributed rooftop solar, approximately. That's a lot. Yeah, right. and then you have another 150 megawatts of grid scale, uh, and then the HECO project that just, the Westlock project that was just announced, another 20 megawatts. And you think about that on a 1,000 megawatt load system in the middle of the day, you're, you can be well above 50% just being served by solar. And so uh, the ability for the grid to accommodate that level of solar in the middle of the day gets to be more and more challenging. And so you have to start thinking about mitigations and what you can do to help integrate more solar. Um, you know, a lot of the new projects coming in, the, the new ones that got PUC approval, those are going to have storage included with them. Uh, so each of those Solar plants will have enough storage to ship that energy into evening peak and overnight periods. And you can actually uh, bring up the second slide. I think that illustrates okay. it. Yeah, so here you have it. Um, this shows two days of operation on a grid. And uh, the yellow in the middle of the day, that's the solar generation. And this is expected uh, once we have some of those uh, the, uh, accepted projects coming in, as well as uh, the next round of solar and storage, which uh, Shannon just brought up, they just got uh, bids received for that. You can see on the left here, the yellow, that's the solar coming in, in the middle of the day. And you can see that it plateaus in the middle of the day. And, and mm -hmm. basically that blue, that's the oil fire generation. And there's only so much flexibility there. So the gray part above that, that would be solar that's curtailed. And you okay. see on the right, that's when we start to add those energy storage. And you can see it takes that surplus solar from the middle of the day, it shifts it into the evening overnight periods, helps you bring on more solar. Now, okay. that's not the only mitigation, though. And you, you want to touch on a few of the others, Matt? Yeah, the, the, um, in terms of the mitigations, well, I was thinking about you know, getting back to that, that low-hanging fruit. And we've talked about a few numbers. We've thrown out a few numbers. You know, we were showing earlier that we're around maybe 20 or 30% of renewables. And yet, Derek is describing kind of in the, there's certain points in the day where we can be over 50%. And so what, is, you know, what, do, what does that mean? What is the, how do those numbers work together? And I, I think it's important to, to differentiate between when we talk about like, the RPS standards and these targets of going to 100% and where we're at about 20 or 30% today, um, that's in terms of energy throughout right. the whole year. Right? But when, we, when you really think about it in terms of reliability and, and managing this, you have to consider at, any, at every given moment, the grid has to be made reliable. And so that's when you're seeing at these instantaneous moments in the, in the middle of the day, as we were showing, that you have to hit those 50, per, you know, that we're hitting those 50% numbers. And so that's why, you know, when we're talking about the, the challenges coming and the low hanging fruit, as we're climbing that scale of these instantaneous rates of renewables throughout the day, 
that's where we're, we're really getting into those challenges. And, and so that's why some of these challenges are so significant and happening at relatively low levels of energy, of, of energy throughout the course of the year. Okay, so we have that big band of blue at the bottom of both slides, which represents like oil fired or fossil fuel uh, generation. How are we ever gonna bite into that? I mean, isn't that gonna require like massive amounts of, of uh, storage? Because you know, you gotta generate all that electricity during the day, store it and or wind. A lot of people say we've kind of maxed out our wind capability here on Oahu. A lot of it may be because uh, people don't want to have, you know, not in my backyard, and we're, we're seeing some of that up here on the North Shore already. So how do we get rid of that big band down at the bottom? Any thoughts? I mean, I don't suppose you have a solution, but how do we bite into that? Yeah, and that's exactly what we're here in doing this modeling, this grid simulation. Right. That's, what, what, that's what we're here to work on is, how do you take a, a bigger bite out of that oil fire generation, the carbon emitting uh, generation? And, and there's uh, a lot of, uh, several answers to that, obviously. Okay. You know, storage is one of them. Right. Uh, load management is another. So how can we more closely align our load, the electric consumers, with the times that the renewables are generating? So can we ship load from that evening and overnight period into mm -hmm. the middle of the day? Uh, can electric vehicles be charged in the middle of the day to avoid CO2 emissions from the transportation sector? Uh, and then there's a host of other mitigations making improvements to that oil fire generation. HECO's um, come a long way, getting those units to be more flexible and allow them to turn down to lower loading levels in right. the middle of the day to cycle on and off more frequently to be able to turn it off. But there's limits to that too. The, the oil fired Generation fleet is, is fairly old here in Hawaii, so some of the oldest units uh, in the country. And so getting flexibility out of the legacy oil units is going to become increasingly challenging. And so um, it could be a host of new technologies that help alleviate that. And I think a part of that, what, one of those also is the renewables themselves. And there's a lot of capability in this new generation, but it, it's still, it's relatively new. In right. terms of the, the span of over 100 years of operating a power system, this is really in the last decade or two. And I think you know, the industry is still understanding how can we fully deploy the capability there. And so that's also part of, it, it, part of this, this slate of solutions that we're looking at is also how do we tune up the existing, the renewables plants to, to make sure that they're contributing the most that they can. So you have another slide. Can we flash up the next slide? So just what we're talking about. Yeah. Absolutely. And here, uh, you know, what we want to talk about is how can you reliably take off and retire some of that old legacy uh, fossil generation and replace it uh, with a host of renewables and storage. Right. And I think storage is going to be a really a valuable tool and a really flexible tool for all the things that happen in the middle of the day, like smoothing out some of the solar variability, providing grid services, shifting that energy to evening peak, mm -hmm. there's still going to be challenges. It's not the only solution. It can't be the only solution. There's going to be challenges that come up. You know, what if uh, you have multiple low solar days in a row? And, and right. you know, there's, exactly. there's times when you know, today, having a fossil-fired uh, unit on the system, when you push that button to start it, you can be you know, you can rest assured that most of the time that's going to start when you need it. With energy storage and renewables, you have to be more careful about managing the state of charge and making sure you forecast out what your renewables are going to look like. Uh, and you have to really manage an energy limited resource. And how do you plan the rest of the grid knowing that some res resources aren't always going to be available? And so we look at this very probabilistically and look at across many years of operation, many years of uh, weather, and look at all the possible. Um, configurations and make sure that when you need energy, there's something there to, to provide it, or there's load flexibility to right. work so around it. So how about energy efficiency? Uh, it was really popular a few years ago, kind of the, at least the visibility level has gone down. I mean, should we be looking at how we do things differently? Yeah, I think energy efficiency goes with part of that, the slate of solutions, but in, in some sense, as we're really, as we're shifting the generation mix, um, it's the energy efficiency piece is, it's really the mix, the, yeah. the shift in technologies more than the energy efficiency um, that is 
that is the hurdle that we're seeing. And so one of the things particularly is, you know, the wind and solar generation, how it connects to the grid, it connects through a device called a power converter. And that's very different from the conventional generation that used a large copper and steel machine that was connected. Right. And so while the energy, you know, while energy efficiency initiatives are good at kind of keeping the total demand down, it's really a technology shift that that is got our attention. And I think kind of on, on the topic of energy efficiency, getting load management is going to be increasingly important. So not just reducing the overall load, but how can we have it be more flexible and respond to right. the, the, the real-time conditions on the grid? That's going to be increasingly important. It's not just about reducing it, but making it more flexible. I see a great future for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. This is a really Thank difficult you. thing that's going to go on and on and on. So I think you've picked a really good business to be in, and I hear you guys are really good at it. So. Believe it or not, we've blown through our time. So uh, well, I told you it would go fast. So thank great. you very thank much. Thank you very guys. much for really having appreciate us. It's it. a great time. Thanks, Mr. Okay, thanks. So aloha, y'all. I'll see you next Wednesday at Hawaii, the state of clean energy.